today we're continuing this series we started last week, brand new. It's called Sent Life on Mission. It's a study, for those of you who are brand new, it's a study of uh, one of the longest books in the New Testament. It's called the, uh, the Book of Acts, the Apostles. And so the author is a man named Luke. We, we met him last week. Luke's uh, smart, he's well-educated, he's a doctor, close personal friends of the Apostle Paul. And he's done a lot of research, historical research, into the early days of the movement of Jesus, starting from the birth of Jesus, all the way to the, uh, the, the, the spread of the movement from Jerusalem uh, after the resurrection, the movement all the way from Jerusalem to Rome over the next 30 years. And so uh, he's writing this account. He writes it down in two volumes. Volume one is the Gospel of Luke. Volume two is the book of Acts. They're designed to be read together, much like a TV show that comes in two different seasons. Season two builds on one. We'll see that more of it today. So Acts is like a sequel to, uh, to, to Luke. He assumes that we've read Luke and we're kind of familiar with all that. That's why we're often delving back into Luke to kind of flesh out the story. So today we're going into season two. I'm calling it season two, episode one. And there on your note sheet, you have a section that says that, Acts uh, uh, episode one, season two. And if you have your Bibles, your apps, let's go ahead and open up to, uh, to Acts chapter one. We're going to go through the first 12 verses today. And uh, he starts off with a bang, uh, a lot going on. So here we go, Acts chapter 1 and verse 1. So he says, in my former book, Theophilus, and so both books are addressed to Theophilus, this uh, man we don't know a lot about, probably a, a Roman official, we're not really sure, but uh, a new believer in Jesus or checking out the chains, uh, claims of Christ. And he says, in my former book, Theophilus, that's the Gospel of Luke, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach um, until the day he was taken up into heaven. And so that's uh, volume one, about what he began to do and teach. Volume two, Acts, what he continues to do and che- uh, teach now through his church. Uh, after he's given uh, instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. Notice this, that Jesus, and we're, we're going to go back and see this day, Jesus was anointed by the Spirit to carry out his ministry as Messiah at his baptism. Uh, and from that point on, he operates in the power of the Holy Spirit. And we see here, even after the resurrection, Jesus now operating in the power with complete dependence on the Holy Spirit as he instructs his followers what's happening. Verse 3, after he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs he was alive. We saw that last week. Final episode of season 1, chapter 24 of Luke, gave several examples. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days, so about a month and a half, he spoke about the kingdom of God. And again, we're going to see today that this was Jesus' primary teaching. Uh, topic. Uh, in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's all about the kingdom of God. Um, and the prophet said that one day God was going to break into human history. He was going to destroy the kingdoms of men. He was going to bring his kingdom. It's going to be a kingdom of righteousness, of joy, and peace. Messiah was going to come, going to reign. And so this, he's teaching them about the kingdom of God. And so uh, on one occasion, verse 4, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised. Notice that word promise. That's where the title for this message comes from, the promise, which you've heard me speak about for John, talking about John the Baptist. Remember season one, we met him in chapter three last week. John the Baptist baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit, whatever that means. We'll come back to that. And so they, they're gathering around him on one of these occasions and said, Lord, um, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, this um, is actually a very logical question. In the Old Testament, and we'll be looking at this a lot today, the prophet said there was going to be a, a, come a time when God was going to break into human history. He was going to destroy the kingdoms of this world, and he was going to bring his kingdom, a kingdom of righteousness, joy, peace, justice. All wrongs will be turned to right. All the prophets talked about this. And one of the things that the prophet said is that when the kingdom of God came, when the Messiah came, that God would pour out his spirit on his people. And so when the disciples hear that Jesus is talking about, uh, wait here till you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, it's signaling to them the start of this messianic age. And so they want to know, is this the time when you are going to bring the kingdom of God in power that's been prophesied? And Jesus says, you know, that's really not your business. Uh, And so (laughs) in verse 7, he says, um, it's not for you to know the times or the dates Uh, Or the blood moons, the Father has set. Uh, Uh, The the Father has set whatever uh, by His authority. Uh, But here's what's it's what's important. Here's what you need to know. You'll receive power 
when the Holy Spirit comes on you. That's what you need to know. And, uh, and here's your job. You're going to be my witnesses. It's going to start right here in Jerusalem. It's going to spread out in the surrounding counties like Judea and Samaria. This movement's going to grow. And this is going to go on to the end of the earth. In fact, we'll, we'll trace this all through the, the book of Acts as it goes all the way through, uh, through Greece and Turkey and so on and all the way to the center of the empire, to Rome. And so after he'd said this, he's taken up in front of them. You know, they're, it's kind of a hovercraft. He just kind of rises up and uh, think of a drone. And, uh, and the cloud hides him from their sight. That's actually significant, this whole cloud theme. We'll talk about that more next week. But he, he kind of hides, he goes in the clouds. And so they're looking intently in the sky as he's going. And suddenly these two men dressed in white, picture Mr. Clean, uh, that they're suddenly there. You know, so like they're there and they're, they're just kind of looking it up. You know, mouths are open. They've never seen this before, right? And he's just going up. And so all of a sudden these two guys dressed in white are there. And remember uh, the final episode of Luke 24, season one, uh, the women go to the tomb to anoint the body of Jesus. He's gone, of course. But remember, two guys dressed in white. And so here we have these two same guys. I guess this is their next assignment. Uh, I don't know. It could be two other guys dressed in white. Uh, maybe they have a lot of people dressed in white up there. I'm not sure. But uh, anyway, it's really funny to me because they ask this question. They're just standing there. You know, you're like looking up like, whoa. And they're just like, they just show up. And they're like, uh, hey, what are you looking at? Like, what are you looking at? Are you serious? And it says, uh, it says, men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking up in the sky? You're like, are you kidding me? We just saw Jesus hovercraft, right? Like, uh, I don't know about you, that's a little weird for down here. Right? So they're, they're looking, and all of a sudden, Jesus, I mean, they know he's got this new body, right? He's got weight. He's got mass. You can touch him. You can feel him. Um, he's got scars. Um, he can eat dinner with you. He's just like, just going up. And they're like, yeah, it's nothing. We do that all the time where we're from. So, um, <laughs> so he said, uh, why why do you stand here looking at the sky? Every time I read that, I go, what are you talking about? Of course, you know, this guy is just flying. But uh, the same Jesus who's been taken from you into heaven, he's going to come back the same way. Remember, Jesus had come back on the clouds of heaven uh, as you've seen him go. And so uh, after that, uh, the apostles, now they're going to go back to Jerusalem. Now, for those of you who've been to Israel, and more and more of us have, remember the, the Mount of Olives, remember, right outside. We were up there Remember, we, were, we start on top looking over uh, Dome of the Rock, and you, you're standing up there and do the little Bible study. And then we, we walk down that road where we almost get run over because all those cars coming. And, and then uh, you go through the you know, Garden of Gethsemane, and then you know, a little bit more down, you're at the bottom, Kidron Valley, up five minutes. It's 15 minutes, right? It's like, a, it's very, you know, it's, it's, like it's not a big deal, um, uh, a walk. And so they're on the Mount of Olives. On the Sabbath day, uh, Jews were only allowed to walk about three quarters of a mile. So they call it a Sabbath day's walk. And so uh, Luke says, so the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives. It's a Sabbath day walk from the city. And so now they're, they're going to be going and kind of hunkering down, waiting for this promise of the Father. And we're going to cut it off right there. But um, what I want to do today is uh, we want to talk about this uh, promise of the Father that I underlined for you. Or that when you went through, you underlined. That uh, Jesus said, wait in Jerusalem until the, the gift the Father has promised. And I think that as followers of Jesus, we often miss this. Like if you're a follower of Jesus, you may know that when we get into chapter 2 of Acts, uh, which we're going to be in a couple of weeks, that the, 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 the day of Pentecost comes and the Holy Spirit falls on the early church, right? Sound like wind, uh, uh, tongues of fire, uh, speaking different languages. And often as followers, as modern day followers of Jesus, we look at that event, and way too quickly, we start saying, what does that event mean for me in my life? Way too quickly, we start saying, hey, do I need to speak in tongues? Do all Christians speak in tongues? We start asking questions like this, and we miss this epic-making event that's happening. And here's what I want you to catch. When the Spirit comes on Pentecost, this is a once-in-a-lifetime, once-in-world-history event. That when the Holy Spirit comes on Pentecost, it's the start of a whole new era. The kingdom of God is coming in power. Uh, it's as much a one-time event as the death of Jesus is a one-time event. It's as much a one-time event as the resurrection of Jesus is a one-time event. This is not just a, a kind of like, hey, some random event. This is what God had promised uh, for hundreds of years that this day would come. And it's a day that changes the course of human history literally. The movement of Jesus is here today because of that day, because of Pentecost. The world has been changed forever by the movement of Jesus, and it's because of Pentecost. And so we're going to get to Pentecost in a couple weeks, 
But today, I want to prepare us for that and help us understand the larger picture, what the, the, what, uh, the part that Pentecost plays and the larger story God is telling uh, in the Bible. And to understand that, we have to understand the backstory to Pentecost. All right? So today, we're going to look back at the backstory to this promise. When Jesus talks about wait for the gift that was promised, what's he talking about? Who promised it? When was it promised? What was promised? And so if you have, if you have your Bibles there, um, or, or your, your note sheet, you see there's a section called the promise, the backstory. And we're going to start there, and then I'm going to come and draw out a couple principles from the backstory, and then we're going to end up with one question for your life. So here we go. Uh, so principle number one. The first principle, oh, I mean, uh, uh, let's start with the backstory. So the backstory, uh, here's how the story begins. In the Old Testament, the prophets uniformly, almost without exception, you can almost open to any prophetic book in the Old Testament. There's a couple exceptions, you know, maybe not Obadiah, maybe not Jonah, but you, can, you open up to most of the prophets. And what you're going to see is there's this uniform testimony that one day God is going to break into human history and bring his kingdom to earth. A uh, classic statement of it, the book of Daniel. Daniel has the vision of the kingdoms and this you know, statue made of different kinds of gold and silver and bronze and so on. And so it's a prophetic uh, unveiling of history. And so we've got the kingdom, uh, we've got starts with Babylon. And then the kingdom of Babylon will be replaced by the kingdom of the Medes and Persians, Persia. And then that will be replaced by Alexander the Great and the Greeks. And then that will be replaced by uh, the Roman Empire, right? The, the kind of the legs of uh, iron, right? So, and so there's this kind of prophetic uh, description it says, and then after, in the days of that final kingdom, the kingdom of God will come, a kingdom made without hands, uh, the kingdom of it will never end, right? And so biblically, uh, the prophet said there's a time when God will break into human history and he will turn all wrongs to right. And the shalom of God will once again come to creation. There'll be new heavens, there'll be new earth. All that's wrong will be righted. You know, you look at our country, you look at our nation, you look at our world today, we live in a fallen planet, don't we? Every time you turn around, there's another global hotspot. I mean, we just cannot get this thing right. Our world is a world of oppression. You know, a lot of people don't know this, but in the last, I believe it's like five years, 250,000 people in Syria have been killed as a result of the conflict in Syria. A quarter of a million people, and the world largely doesn't know or care. Right? You read, last week, I read an article from the New York Times where our soldiers in Afghanistan have been instructed that child rape is so prevalent in the culture of Afghanistan, do not interfere with the rape of children because it's part of their culture. We live in a day and age, and it's not unique to us, it's been throughout human history, that the, the history of the human race is one of pain and suffering and oppression. And it just changes from regime to regime. And the prophets of Israel said, one day God will break into human history and say, enough, and he will bring his kingdom to earth, and justice will prevail, and the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth like the waters cover the sea, and all things will be made new, new heavens and new earth. Amen. Right? Amen. And so the prophets predicted this. And it, the details are sketchy. That's why everyone argues over them. But the details were sketchy, but the big picture is clear. And one of the things the prophets said is that when the kingdom of God comes, God will pour out his spirit on all his people. Now, in the Old Testament, we see the spirit poured out on specific people, usually as for short term. So it's not a long term thing. And so you'll see uh, the spirit of the Lord comes on Gideon. The Spirit of the Lord comes on Samson. Uh, the Spirit of the Lord comes on David. The Spirit of the Lord comes on King Saul. And the Spirit of the Lord leaves King Saul. And, and so you see this. Uh, many times we forget this, but King David, you know, he, when before he's king and he goes to fight Goliath, and he says, hey, uh, when, I, when the bear came, I killed the bear. When the lion came, we forget that David was already anointed by the Spirit at that point. That's why he could kill the lion and the bear. And so throughout the Old Testament, 
when God needed something special done, he would often anoint a, a, a man or woman to carry that out by his spirit, right? But it wouldn't usually last, it was short term. But here is the prediction. The prediction is that when the kingdom of God comes, God will pour out his spirit on all his people and catch this, and it will start because he will pour out his spirit on the Messiah, the king, the great king of the coming kingdom. And the Messiah, empowered by the spirit, will bring justice to the nations. You see, this is all part of the story. So for example, there on your note sheet, just to give you a taste of this, in Isaiah 44, here's one of the prophecies. God says, I'll pour out my spirit on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I'll pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants, right? Look at the next verse. This is all about the Messiah. And so God is speaking. Here is my servant, talking about Messiah. Here is my servant who I will hold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring what? Justice to the nations. Not just individual salvation to souls, justice to the nations. All wrongs will be turned to right, you see? And so when we open up the, uh, the New Testament, the pages of the New Testament, what we need to understand is we are starting, I've used this analogy of Luke being like season one, season two. It's a great analogy. We'll continue to use it. But from a larger scale, it's like uh, when we open up the New Testament, it's like we're opening up season six of Lost, right? <laughs> there have been five seasons, we call them the Old Testament. I hate that name. The former Testament, the previous Testament, something. It's not old. It's very much alive. Right? And so uh, we are stepping into the midst of a huge story. And the story is, is that one day the kingdom of God will come, Messiah will come and be anointed with his spirit. And so when Luke starts his gospel, the first four or five major events are all prophetic events that he was stepping in the fulfillment of chapter six. So for example... The first thing that happens in the Gospel of Luke after the birth narratives, which, by the way, all refer to the longer story of the kingdom of God. But the first thing that happens is that a man named John the Baptist comes, first prophet in 400 years. What's his message? The kingdom of God is near. This kingdom that the prophets have been talking about, it's near. It's getting close. So you better get ready because here's the thing. The kingdom of God is righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Spirit. And so when the king comes, he will clean up all of his kingdom from all its oppressive and evil and wrong. And so if you want to be part of his kingdom, you need to repent and let him clean you up. Because he is going to straighten everything in this world that is bent, including us. And if you don't want to be straightened out, you're going to be destroyed. Because if he left evil people in his kingdom, it would be an evil kingdom. And we would have the same old problem. And this is why it's always presented in the Bible. When Messiah comes, when the kingdom of God comes, it will be time of both judgment and times of blessing. Judgment for those who are in rebellion will be destroyed. It was for the idea of biblical hell and into the world and that kind of thing. And then it's been salvation and healing and restoration and beauty for those who are willing to be made right. And so when John comes, John comes and he is saying the kingdom of God is at hand. You better get right. You better be on the right side of the kingdom. You better repent. You better come under God's leadership and let him heal you and restore you and stop ripping people off and stop beating up on people and soldiers, stop extorting money. He says, God is coming and you need to get ready. And so that's his message. But then he also says this. Look what he says there in uh, Luke chapter three. We're just running through these verses one by one. John answered them all and he said, I baptize you with water, but one more powerful than I is coming you know, they asked him, are you the Messiah? He's like, no, 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 but one's more coming, more powerful. He said, the thongs of whose sandals, I'm not worthy to untie, and let us be a servant or slave. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So he says, so I am here baptizing you with water. It's symbolic. It's symbolic of you cleansing yourself, preparing yourself for the coming of Messiah. But when he comes, it's the real deal. He's bringing the Spirit who will cleanse you. He's bringing the Spirit that will uh, restore you 
and he will separate the wheat from the chaff and burn all his enemies. That's John's vision, right? He was right in the vision, just a little wrong on the timing. And so Jesus comes, right? So this is how the gospel starts. It starts with the prophet coming and saying, the kingdom is coming, get ready. The Messiah who's going to be anointed by the Spirit, as was said, prophesied, is coming. And so when Jesus comes, these events are in rapid succession in Luke's gospel, one right after another. When Jesus comes, what happens? He goes and he's baptized. And what happens when he comes out? He's anointed with the Spirit. Men and women, this is not some random act. This is a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. That for the Messiah to lead the nations in justice, he has to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so look what happened. It says, uh, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was open. The Holy Spirit descended on him bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son. This is messianic language. Whom I love with you, I'm well pleased. And so now what Luke is telling us through John's voice what Luke is telling us is the two promises of the Old Testament. The Spirit will be poured out and the Messiah will be anointed. We, game is on. Messiah is here. Messiah is anointed. And the promise is he will anoint his people in the Holy Spirit. And so now Jesus, we're going to see a change in Jesus. Why? Because he's anointed by the Spirit. He's going to carry out his entire ministry and the power of the Holy Spirit. And so look at the next passage. What happens? So Jesus is now full of what? Okay, remember that terminology. Because in Acts 2, when the Holy Spirit comes on the day of Pentecost, Luke will use that exact terminology. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So Jesus was the first to be full of the Spirit. He's our leader. And so Jesus is now full of the Spirit. And he returns from the Jordan, where he'd been baptized. And he was, catch he was led by the Spirit. And so now Jesus is operating under the power of the Spirit. He's led by the Spirit into the desert, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. Why? Why did Jesus go in the desert for 40 days before launching his ministry? Because if you are go coming to attack the kingdom of darkness, you have to start by taking on the king of darkness. And so he goes into one-on-one -on -one warfare with the great enemy of God, and he defeats him in the desert and those early skirmishes, and so now what happens? He comes out in the power of the Spirit. And so that's what has, happens next. So Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And now news is spreading throughout the whole countryside. And so now Luke tells us he's going to begin to go to the synagogues and begin to teach. Now it's interesting. If you were to read the Gospel of Mark, he would tell you that Jesus started his ministry in Capernaum. We studied that a couple years ago, kind of center of his headquarters. It's later he goes on to Nazareth. But that's not how Luke tells the story. He skips over that part. And he says he's teaching in the synagogues. Let me tell you what happened at Nazareth. Why? Because Nazareth is where Jesus defined who he is and his mission. And at Nazareth, he comes to his hometown. They uh, ask him to teach. They ask for the scroll of Isaiah. They give him the scroll of Isaiah. He unpacks it until he gets to chapter 6, what we would call 61. They didn't have numbers then. But he finds uh, 61. And, uh, and it's, a, it's a prophecy about Messiah. And look which prophecy he chooses. He says, The Spirit of the Lord, it should be all caps, Yahweh, the Spirit of Yahweh is on me because he's anointed me. <coughs> Messiah is speaking. <coughs> he says, The Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of Yahweh has come upon me. This is what came upon Gideon. It's what came upon Samson. The Spirit of Yahweh has come upon me. And he's anointed me. Why? <coughs> Here's my assignment. I'm to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, both spiritually and physically, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And so Jesus self-defines. I have come. After he quoted that passage, he sat down. We're told that every eye in the synagogue was on him. What is he going to say about that passage? And he said, this day, this scripture has been fulfilled. Messiah has come. The baptizer in the spirit has come. He is operating in the power of his spirit. And we will watch him now in the power of the spirit go out. And he will bring, share good news with the poor. 
He will, he will share his story that it doesn't matter where you've come from or what you've done in life. It doesn't matter whether you're theologically educated or not. It doesn't matter if you're a prostitute, if you're a publican, you're an uh, extortionist tax gatherer. It doesn't matter if you're a high up religious leader, that there is a way for you to come home. There is a way to be part of the kingdom. God is on the move. You can be involved. It doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done. It doesn't matter how deep your sin or how great your rebellion. It doesn't matter what side of the track or where you were raised. It doesn't matter your education or what's been done to you. It doesn't matter whether you're high or low or in between. If you want to be a part of what God is doing in his kingdom, there is a wide open door and there's a king who has come to rescue you. And he went out and he shared the message. And wherever he went, he healed the sick. I love what Acts says in Peter, uh, Acts 10. Peter will describe the ministry of Jesus. He went around setting free people free from the devil and doing good. Amen. And wherever Jesus went, the kingdom went. And the kingdom of God was rolling back the kingdom of darkness. And when the religious leaders said, you cast out demons by, by Beelzebub, the, the prince of demons, he said, that is not the truth. He said, I cast out demons by the power of God, and if I cast out demons by the power of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you, and I am taking back the captives the enemy has rescued, and I am taking them back. And so this is the start of Jesus' ministry. This is who he is. It's why he's come. He is the anointed one. He is anointed with the Spirit. But by the time we get to the end of volume one, the second promise of the prophets that he would baptize in the Holy Spirit has not yet happened. The Messiah has come. He's been anointed. He's operating in the power of the Spirit. The kingdom of God's advancing. But the gift of the Spirit, the promise of the Father, has not yet been given. And so now we understand, if you go back to Acts 1-4, that's the backstory. And so in Acts 1-4, on one occasion, he's eating with them, and he gives them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, wait for the gift my father promised. That's the backstory. Wait here. You can't move until he comes. Now, what I want to do today is lay out a couple big picture principles about the work of the Spirit that are going to carry us all the way through the book of Acts they're incredibly important for our life as we follow Jesus, as we live a life that's sent. And so here we go. Number one, the first thing that we need to catch today is the Spirit is the key to the kingdom. The Spirit is the key to the kingdom. The Spirit is the one who unlocks the door of the kingdom of God to us. If you were to study the life and teaching of Jesus, especially in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, what you'd see is Jesus' primary topic was the kingdom of God. Uh, just like John the Baptist came about as near when Jesus came, exactly what he said. In fact, there in your note sheet, in uh, Mark chapter 1, right after his baptism, this is how Mark summarizes the teaching of Jesus. Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. Here it is, the time has come. What time? The, come, the, the time of the kingdom, the, the prophets have talked about. The time has come. The kingdom of God's near. He says, so repent and believe the good news. So he says that God's on the move. Uh, the kingdom of God is coming very close. It, 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 we're almost there. And the good news is you can be a part. It doesn't matter what you've done, where you've been, but you have to repent. You have to come under the leadership of your king. You can't be living a life of evil and injustice um, and, and be part of this kingdom that's righteousness. And so you have to come under the leadership of your king, turn around, come under my leadership, uh, and then you have to believe that what I'm telling you, that it doesn't matter where you're coming from, God loves you and you can have a fresh start. You've got to trust me in this, right? So repent and believe. We're going to uh, turn and we're going to trust. And so Jesus is laying out this mission and that's, kind of, that's what, what his mission was about. So wherever he goes, he teaches about the kingdom, what the kingdom is like, what it looks like to live in the kingdom, what kingdom life is like, uh, how you look at things. If you're a kingdom person, all about the kingdom, what it's going to be like to be a citizen of this new kingdom, how to live in this new kingdom. And so the apostles had heard this teaching on the kingdom for years. Um, this had been their bread and butter. They had, I want you to catch it, they had traveled with Jesus for three years. I want you to think about this. I mean, every day you're with Jesus, walking miles and miles and miles on the road, talking with Jesus, 
Whenever Jesus teaches, front row seats. When you don't understand, you can ask him backstage. What was that about? Didn't, didn't quite follow that. Can speak in the green room. Uh, and, uh, and so they, they're there. When, when, they, the guy healed, when the guy's healed, they let him down through the roof. He walks out. They were there. They saw it, forgiving sins. They, they saw that. Um, when he opened the, he spit in the mud, put it on the, blind, the guy's eyes, and the guy could see. They were there. They saw that. Uh, when he walked on water in the middle of the night, kind of doing that uh, kind of surfing thing uh, on the waves, they he was there, right? It's uh, uh, crazy, you know, five-foot swells. And he's uh, walking up and down. And like, awesome. You know, when, when uh, water into wine, you need 150 gallons of wine, you know, don't call Bevmo, call Jesus. We're going to do that, you know. We're going we're gonna to get the best stuff. It's going to be good. It's right here. You don't have to deliver. It's already here on the property. Um, and so you get, I saw that. Uh, they, Lazarus, come forth. They see the dead bite coming out. You know, you know so they, they see that, right? They, they've been there. And now recently, they saw him getting beat up, uh, killed, executed, and come back to life. Yeah, didn't get, he couldn't keep good men down. You know? It's like, uh, I can do anything. Uh, I'm Superman. You know? uh, I'm the Lord of heaven and earth. And, and, then, like, and then for the next last 40 days, uh, they've been doing Bible study with Jesus. Right? So they're getting out to Bibles. You wonder how they got so smart in Acts. You know how the apostles were so dumb and, this, and the gospels get so smart in Acts. They got, they're quoting scripture and all this stuff. Like, what did you ever stop and think? For 40 days, he's been explaining what this stuff means, you know. And so uh, we'll see that, and we'll see that as we go through the sermons and acts. And so they've been with Jesus, and, and what's he teaching for the last 40 days? He's talking about the kingdom of God. Then he's running three years, and then he's resurrected, kingdom of God. Like, if anyone is ready to go out and share the message, it's these guys. And Jesus don't even think about it. Don't even think about it. But it, you may have heard a lot about the kingdom and you know a lot of head knowledge about the kingdom, but you haven't entered the kingdom yet. You don't have the power of the kingdom. You, you can't change yourself. You, you don't have the kingdom lives. You guys be a flop. You guys have to wait here. And this is exactly what the prophets had said. You look at the big picture story of the Bible. God loves Israel. He chooses Israel. Takes them to Mount Sinai, gives them the law of God, one of the greatest gifts you could give to any people. We often think of the law in negative terms. It's not negative, it's positive. Moses says, who like any other nations has a law like we have? You know, even the law, the word in Hebrew, Torah, means instruction. It's not just law, it's instruction. Think of Psalm 119, I run the path of your commands. You've set my heart free. Your word's a light into my path. It's a lamp into my feet. Your word has made me wiser than all my teachers. I mean, the word of God is this incredible gift that he gives to the nation. Here's a path to life. Remember what Jesus said, you can sum up all the law with two commands, love God and love people. It's incredible. God gives them the law. The problem wasn't the law. The problem was the people. There's something broken in the human heart. There's something broken in your heart and my heart. We are a self-absorbed people. We can make all the resolutions we want, and we're going to end up still serving ourselves. We can try to love God, but we're going to run after other gods. We're going to create idols in our own image. It's the way we are. Apart from Jesus, apart from his work in our life, we're a fallen race. Paul says, in me that is in my flesh, naturally, there is no good thing. Jeremiah says, the heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? Right? We are a fallen race. The problem with Israel wasn't the law. The problem was Israel. And the problem wasn't Israel. The problem was fallen human nature. They are human. And so the prophets predicted that one day God would step in and he would change his people from the inside out. That he would not just forgive their sins, he would do that, but he would actually come and he would move them at a heart level. He would change their core desires. He would change their motivation. He would give them the power to be the people they were created to be, to love God and love people. And it would be supernatural. It would be completely them. It wasn't from memorizing verses. It wasn't from praying. It wasn't from all these spiritual disciplines. It was just a work of God supernaturally at the core of their being that the Spirit would come, and that's what would happen. In fact, there in your note sheet, I gave you just an example. There's so many of these. I, I love these passages of the Old Testament. I, I pray, like this passage, I pray this over my grandkids. I pray this passage over my, my kids. I pray this passage over our church. God, will you move us? 
Will you move us? We, we cannot follow you. We're fallen human beings. We can't follow you. We can't love you. We can't be obedient. We can't be passionate for the things that break your heart. We're self-absorbed. We need you to move us. We know where we need to get. We know where we are. We can't get there. We need you to move us. And so look what God says through Ezekiel. He says, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. In other words, I'll forgive your sins. I'll cleanse you from all your impurities, from all your idols. I'll give you a new what? A new heart. I'll put a new spirit in you, a heart transplant. I will remove from you your heart of what? Stone, your heart, insensitive. You don't care about people. You don't care about God. You care about yourself. I'll remove that heart of stone. I'll give you a heart of flesh, tender heart. He used it in a positive sense. He said, I'll put my spirit in you and catch this. I will move you to follow my decrees and be careful. Man, how many of you, you want to be moved by God? Man, I want to be moved by God. I tried for years to move myself. I couldn't move myself. Bible study, prayer, fasting, memorization. I couldn't move myself. I needed someone to move me. I needed someone to do something in me I could not do for myself. And that's what we all need. We are part of a fallen race. If we're going to be moved, we need a mover in our life, right? And so this was the prophecy. And so this is why Jesus says, I know you've been with me for three years. I know you've heard me teach about the kingdom. I know you've seen me after the resurrection. I know you're excited about the message of forgiveness. I know you're passionate about that. I know this, but you are not ready. Don't even think of leaving Jerusalem until the gift comes. Why? Because the gift unlocks the kingdom. He said, I can tell you about the kingdom, but the Spirit is the one who will open your eyes to who I am, why you need forgiveness, why you need to give me your life, and the Spirit is the one who will empower you to change and to grow and to live life in the kingdom and to be transformed from who you are to who you're created to be. So when people see you, they see me. And when they see you, they say, I want that. Because you're changed, and it's not a self-effort, willpower, religious habitual pattern. It is a life-giving change that comes supernaturally by my spirit. And so just don't even think about, remember the old commercial, don't leave home without it? You're like, don't even think of leaving Jerusalem and trying this on because you will get beat up and you'll get discouraged and it's not going to work. So wait. And what he says to his apostles, he says to us, without the Holy Spirit, we can do nothing. And men and women, before we even, in this series, talk about living life on mission, we have to go back, and I have to ask you, are you filled with his spirit? We will come back to this more today. But now, are you filled with his spirit? Are you experiencing the presence of his spirit in your life? When you read scripture, do you sense it coming alive as the spirit opens God's word to you? Do you have a hunger to know God in your life? Do you have a passion? God, I want to have my heart break for the things that break yours. Do you love people? Do you serve well? Is he freeing you from your addictions? Are you experiencing the power of God? We're not ready to live life on mission until we've experienced the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we have to come back to the basics. And so as we start this journey, are we ready? And that leads to number two. Number two is that the Spirit empowers us for life on mission. So what we saw in the prophet Ezekiel is that the, the prophecy was that in the future when the Spirit came, two things would happen. Number one, he would wash away our impurities, our sin. That, and we learned that through the coming of the Messiah, he would die for our sin. So our sins can be forgiven, right? So that's the first gift we receive. The second gift is a gift of the Spirit who changes us, transforms us. And so um, 
What I want you to catch is when a man or woman comes to Christ and he gives us his spirit to lead us and guide, as we follow, he transforms us. And we change at a core level from who we are. and We become people that are lovers of God and lovers of people. And the more we follow, the more we listen, the more we love, the more we care. And our marriages begin to heal. And we begin to get wiser as parents. We begin to raise our kids well. And our families begin to come together. And our finances shape up through the wisdom of the Holy Spirit and the self-control that he gives us. And we begin to get back in control of our life financially. And he begins to release you know, gifts in our life to serve others. And we, we begin to, our life begins to heal under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And this is what Jesus meant when he said, I've come to give you life and life to the full, right? He, the Holy Spirit transforms us. But here's what I want you to catch. When you came to Jesus and he gave you the Holy Spirit, it wasn't just for you. It wasn't just so that you could be happy and fulfilled and have a great marriage or great kids or succeed on the job or have your finances get squared away. It was for all of that, but it's not just for that. That when God gave you his Holy Spirit, when Jesus gave you his Holy Spirit, it was so that you could be transformed to go on mission with him. Because as we saw last week in John 17, this is what Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. So we are the body of Christ. He is our head, is he not? And the head and heart of our leader are to seek and save the lost. And therefore, when we join him, we become his body, his hands, and his feet to carry out his mind and his heart for this world. Does that make sense? And so he saves us, and he fills us with the Spirit, not just to restore and to heal us, but to send us out a life on mission to help heal a broken world, to carry out Isaiah 61 ministry, to pick up where he left off, to preach the good news to the poor, to bring recovery of the sight to the blind, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, that as followers of Jesus, we are to be agents of healing in a world of disease. As Jesus went around freeing people from the devil and doing good, so are we. We are him, we are his body. He is our head and he is our heart and we are his body. And he, he fills us with his spirit so we can go life on mission. And so his life becomes a model for our life. And so, for example, there in your note sheet, I put a great quote. Oh, before you do that, look at, look at Acts 1.8. And so this is what he means in Acts 1.8, where he says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Now listen, listen, church. You're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes. Is it power to change? Yes. Is it power so you have the fruit of the Spirit in your life? Yes. Is it power so you have power over sin in your life? Yes. But that's not what he says here. It is all of that. But here, it's about mission. And he said, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you'll be my witnesses. You see? And so think of Jesus and how the Holy Spirit transformed him for a life on mission. Uh, I put a quote on your note sheet from J.P. Moreland, who's just a Tremendous author, he's an apologist, he's a theologian. Last thing he knew, he was at Talbot Seminary. But he wrote a great book called Kingdom Triangle. And and look what he says, when I was saved in the late 1960s, I was taught that Jesus' miracles proved that he was God because he did them from his divine nature. It's become clear to me, however, that this was wrong. For Jesus' public ministry was done as he, a perfect man, did what he saw his father doing, in dependence on the filling of the Holy Spirit. That's what we've read today, didn't we, in Luke? The power of the Spirit. And so he quotes Thomas Oden, who's a theologian. He says, as a man, Jesus walked day by day in radical dependence upon God the Spirit. How did Jesus set captives free? By living every day in radical dependence on the Holy Spirit. Mr. Oden continues, And he said, he prayed and he spoke by the power of the Spirit. And in portraying Jesus as constantly dependent on the Spirit, the Gospels were not challenging his deity or his divine sonship. Rather, as eternal Son of God, the theandric person, which means the God-man, he was truly God. While as man, Jesus was truly human, bone of our bone, flesh of our flesh, seed of Abraham, whose humanity was continually replenished by the Spirit. 
He did not walk or speak by his own independent human power, but by the power of the Spirit. What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? It means the same Spirit that was on Jesus is the Spirit that's in you so that you can join Jesus and his mission to do what Jesus did as on full dependence, reliance on the Holy Spirit. We go out to share the good news with the poor and open the eyes of the blind. And as we bring the, the great news, the acceptable year of our God. You see? Now, so the question then, there in your note sheet, there's a question. I want to wrap up with a question. And this is actually called the promise, one question. And, I, and I, here's my question for you. Have you received the gift? This whole message is about wait in Jerusalem for the gift my Father promised. The question is, have you received the gift? Have you received the Holy Spirit? Now, I'm going to make this easy. Some of you here uh, may be new to Rocky Peak, fairly new, uh, and God is meeting you here. It's a whole new experience. You may have never been in church before. It's a whole new experience. And uh, I know because I talk with you periodically, and you'll tell me things like, I don't know what happened. I hadn't been in church. I came in, and, and I just, uh, man, there's something special about this place. And I start to sing. And I, there's songs, and it's like tears are coming down. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's happening to me. Um, and I, I've really enjoyed the messages, and I feel like I understand them. They're speaking to me. I'm, I'm excited to be coming. And so God is stirring you. And he's preparing you for a transaction. He's preparing you to enter the kingdom of God. And, and so that happens when we come to a place in our life where the Holy Spirit begins to open our eyes to who Jesus is. And we begin to understand that we're part of a rebel race, you and I. And that we've all sinned and, as the Bible says, fallen short of the glory of God. Like we're fallen short of what we're supposed to be, like God. Um, and there's something wrong with this. And if, if you were to die in a day and you stand before God, you would, you'd be dead to rights. So it's like you know, you, you're guilty. And you're, you're guilty of death. Uh, you're guilty and, you're, and you're, you're liable of death. And so you know that. And yet as you sit here today uh, and you listen about the promise of God to come and cleanse away your impurities, it doesn't matter where you've come from, where you, it's where you're going, that Jesus can forgive you based on his death for you on the cross, you hear about the, the promise of his spirit to change you from the inside out. There is something inside your chest right now that's leaping out. You just want that. You want Jesus. You want to be forgiven. You want to give him your life. You want to start your life all over again. You want that. And uh, I would say for you, then as of right now, you don't have the Holy Spirit. You haven't, the Bible says, until you come to Jesus and give him your life and you repent and you won't receive the Holy Spirit. When you do, you will. And so in a couple of minutes, I'm going to give you a chance to give your life to Christ and receive his Holy Spirit. Now, I want to talk to the rest of us here that are, we, we see ourselves as self-proclaimed Christians. And I want to ask you some questions. I want to ask you about how excited are you about God? And I want to ask you, how excited are you about his word? And I want to ask you, how passionate are you about his kingdom? And I want to ask you, when you read the Word of God, is it coming alive to you and speaking power in life? And I want to ask you, when you come to church, are you being filled up and inspired to go out to live for Him? I want to ask you, do you have a heart for lost people? Do you care about the people? Are you being transformed to be like God? Are you being changed from the inside out? Do you have power over your addictions? Are you experiencing the power of Christ in your life? Because men and women... If you claim to be a Christian, this is your birthright. You see, in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul says, no one can say and mean it that Jesus is Lord except from the Holy Spirit. So if you sit here and say, I believe Jesus is the Christ. I believe he died for my sins. I believe that I made right with God only through Christ alone. Uh, I believe in the Bible. I believe it's his word. Yes, I'm a Christian then I say, well, then you have the Spirit of God. Because no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And furthermore, about 10 verses further down the page, Jesus, uh, Paul says all of us who are, have acknowledged Jesus as Lord, all of us have been baptized by one Spirit into one body. And so this is what I know about you. If you believe in Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit. But I have a question for you. The question is, does the Holy Spirit have you? 
Are you filled with His Spirit? Are you passionate about Jesus and His love for you and His plan for your life and His plan for the world? And if you're not, I want to tell you, this is your birthright. This is what you were created for. Love God with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength, all your soul. If you love God with all that, there's not room for a whole lot more. You love him. He is your passion. Has your relationship with Jesus become like a boring marriage? Yeah, we're married. <laughs> Pass the ketchup. <laughs> For a lot of Christians, it's like, yeah, I'm married. You know, we're going to be together forever. Hoorah. <laughs> hey, if that's you, man, woman, wake up. You are created for something more. God loves you. He died for you. He chose you. He wants to work his work in your life. He wants to change you from the inside out. He wants to give you a passion for what's right and good and true. He wants to use you in the world. He wants you waking up in the morning excited about life, not bored with life. He doesn't want you mediocre. He didn't die so you could be bored. He wants you. He loves you. He's come after you. He has his spirit for you. Come home. Wake up. Get on your knees. Repent. Say, Father, I have sinned. I have not listened to your spirit. I've rejected your spirit. I've said no to you in my finances. I've said no to you in my sex life. I've said no to you with popularity. I've resisted for so long. I have grieved you so long. I have quenched the Holy Spirit. Have mercy on me, O Father, and light in me a passion for your Son that exceeds all other passions and fuels my life. Amen? Amen. Amen.